natural crisis. And I think in games, in this kind of walled garden that we create, we tend to, how should I say, kind of like insulate ourselves from real reflection on the material circumstances outside our industry. And we tend not to allow for the kind of dialogues between those, the, the real dialogues between those external factors and our internal circumstances. So what I want to do today is just reflect on some of those things in practical terms. So I'm going to tell two contemporary stories, okay? And those stories are intimately linked to one another. And I'm going to tell the, you know, the slightly more downbeat one <laughs> first. So the global financial crisis, or rather global financial crisis, I hate the global financial crisis because it predicates this kind of singular you know, event when actually you're looking at a systemic failure around the world. So just to summarize what happened, after 9-11 in America, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates leading to an increase in lending. Okay? Because the markets wobbled and there was worries about inflation and so the, um, the interest rate was slashed to 1%. And then in kind of concert with that process, deregulation and the collapse of mortgage underwriting services meant that predatory loans and subprime mortgages were offered to many Americans who would not have had access to these forms of credit previously. So... Basically, what's happening is you've got this huge influx of new people into the mortgage market because the credit circumstances are unprecedented in that time. You're talking, you know, post between 2001 and 2006, radical changes to the way credit is moving in North America, but also in Europe and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, and the key thing to reflect on here is that financial regulation had not developed in step with finan financial innovation. Okay? So key mortgage providers, home loan providers, and so on, insurance firms, financial institutions are, are kind of like, you know, sort of riffing on the incredibly um, beneficial circumstances that they find themselves in post the interest rate slash. Okay? And what happens is that you have circa 2006, in the peak of the bubble, a huge number of new participants in the space of you know, home loan borrowing. And these people are borrowing 100% of their mortgage. They have no deposit. They have 100% of their mortgage um, borrowed from the bank. So they are acutely vulnerable to changes in the marketplace, the job market, and so on, any fluctuation in their income is going to have a massive drastic impact. And of course, as the markets start to wobble in around 2008, that volatile mortgage debt starts to become a problem. It becomes a particularly uh, virulent problem because that mortgage debt has been bundled together, chopped up, and sold as a form of speculative investment. Okay. So financial institutions around the world have said, look, we've got this really risky debt, but we can actually you know, avert some of that risk by bundling it, chopping it up, doing all of these kind of like arcane financial things to it. And then we can bet on it and speculate on it and make, turn, you know, produce these huge revenues. Okay? So a person's mortgage, a person's home loan, has actually been systematically kind of disassembled and no longer, you know, you might take your mortgage out with Lehman Brothers, but it turns out when push comes to shove, Lehman Brothers don't technically own that mortgage anymore. Someone else owns that mortgage. And so things have been kind of drastically reorganized. So these toxic debts made up of subprime home loans and financial derivatives swept through the financial markets. There was no... Um, way for financial institutions to effectively um, kind of insulate themselves from these, from these toxic debts because they had all been playing the same game. They'd all been following the same formula, buying into the same kind of like systemic practices. And they knew, they knew, they knew the high risk stakes. Um, Angelo Mozilla of Countrywide Financial says, in, you know, in March 2006, Mozilla wrote that the lender's program of granting subprime loans for 100% of the value of the borrower's home was, quote, the most dangerous product in existence 
and there can be nothing more toxic and therefore requires that no deviation from the underwriting guidelines be permitted irrespective of these circumstances. He's saying, in effect, if we're going to have these 100% loans, which we really shouldn't, absolutely do not deregulate. Do not kind of like remove the foundation that will make them in, in the, a minimal way stable. And of course, that's what happens. So that's story number one. It's a story which frames all of our choices. We tell ourselves this story in Australia that the mining boom has insulated us from the full force of the GFC and that we don't feel these factors. But as a games maker, I'm primarily an exporter. Australia is a relatively small domestic market. My media goes out into the international sphere, and so I'm constantly having to reflect on the financial circumstances of the population in the broader kind of global community of games players. So a second narrative runs in parallel to that narrative, the casual revolution. So when I, in the past, I've, you know, I've written a lot of stuff about games, and um, the way that I define games um, in my work is I talk about what I call the video game gestalt. The, the video game is really like a, a super, super complex product. It's art, code, and, des and design, each themselves uh, distinct in their disciplinarity, overlapping to create a kind of fourth product in the space that exists between you know, the productive use of those disciplines. Um, video games are really kind of built from these from these pillars, and we, you know, in our in our process of kind of coming to terms with and understanding video games, you know, we we systematically think about these different areas. What does it mean to code a video game? What does it mean to, you know, create art for a video game? To design a video game. The key thing about the video game gestalt. To people who are outside of games, they think, God, that's a, that's a ton to learn. If I'm going to make video games, that's so much to learn. And I, I'm, I'm an arty person. How can I ever become a Cody person? Or I'm a Cody person. How can I become a designy person? And we really have these very, very, um, it seems like an insurmountable task to kind of master all of these practices and become proficient in all of these pillars in order to make a video game. And from a financial perspective, this is incredibly expensive. To have the best practitioners in art, code, and design makes the proposition of making a video game one of expense, uh, management of highly skilled workers, and so on and so forth. So then something happened over the kind of like 2000 between 2000 and the present, what, which we kind of think of as the casual revolution. And I've argued elsewhere that the casual revolution was about the kind of pretend discovery of a new audience, OK? An opportunity for developers to participate in the broader changes that had begun to surround them. You, you read a lot of games, uh, criticism, and journalism that kind of like, you know, runs with the story that it was like, you know, Iwata-san being like, oh my god, if we just change the controller, we've discovered all these new people as though they, they had no conception that they ever existed, you know. Oh, we just, we knew these hardcore gamers, these game fans, you know, we had a really good sense of who they were. And then, oh my god, we found all these new people. Um, I, don't buy, I don't buy that kind of narrative, but I can see why it's a useful one. It creates, um, in a moment of stagnation, a kind of breath of fresh air. Um, it allows us to tell ourselves that we are capable of surprising ourselves as an industry. Um, but the key thing is that it was an opportunity for, de for developers to, to participate in the broader changes that had begun to surround them. The rise of the mobile phone market, the rise of Web 2.0, the rise of social. You have an increased connectedness among people. The decline of a notion of private in favor of a notion of a kind of shared experience as part of the broader context. Okay, so the casual revolution, if anything, was the games industry giving itself permission to kind of open up and reflect on this whole body of new people. 
And there's a technological and cultural aspect to the casual revolution as well. Um, casual games engage not just old developers, but new ones drawn from a diverse pool of passionate and curious participants. If we think of this, you know, in the 1990s game development, you have a, you know, a monoculture of developers um, developing in a relatively small total number around the world um, at vast expense using very bespoke tools that weren't freely available to the general public. Move forward 10 years, uh, and particularly move forward 20 years, and we start to see that those developers, you know, many of them still work in the games industries, but they're intermingled with a whole bunch of other people. There's much more of a kind of plural uh, uh, and more varied kind of um, developer community. And the overall price of development has plunged because tools have become radically democratized. The barriers to entry have been radically reduced. And so you have a... Um, an, an ability for a whole new group of people to come in and participate in the sector, okay? So, at the same time, crucially, from 2001 to the present, you know, universities are accrediting games courses, games studies comes online as a kind of discipline in its own right, organizations like DIGRA start to form, and within the journalistic, critical, academic, and professional community, um, the video game Gestalt begins to kind of draw criticism in both theory and practice because people feel like they haven't ever before really asked that question, what is a game? You know, what is a game? What, you know, like, what, what makes up its core? And so a question mark starts to hover around these pillars. We go, do games need to have art or can they be really minimal? Do they need to have design or can they be really experiential? Do they need to have code? Can we just build them in kind of tools like Game Maker, which are much more modular? And so, in effect, as a result of that discourse rolling out over a 10-year period, you know, with significant pushes in Scandinavia, like the kind of ludology thought process and so on, we see a kind of separation. The practical skills, um, if in effect, become clustered as kind of like you know, what it means to simply execute a concept. And this broad notion of mechanics and all of its kind of concomitant practices becomes the kind of enduring core of what defines a game. And we end up with this notion of the mechanic is the message. Games are really mechanics. You know, the art doesn't need to be anything. The audiovisual elements don't need to be anything. It, you know, so long as the mechanic is sound. Um, and so Nicholas, here's a big quote, I won't go there, but Nicholas Lavelle talks about how, you know, games don't need to be polished. They don't need this AAA art finish because we've got this kind of mechanical core that if we polish it sufficiently, it builds engagement and satisfaction and all of those things. One of the problems of separating those original gestalt pillars from one another and asking the question, what is a game, and, and putting all your eggs in the mechanic basket is that games become reduced to a series of verbs and rules to be cut and pasted, losing the stability of their context. It's like, oh, you know, my mechanic is about nurturing, or it's about leveling, or it's about sharing, or it's about exploring. And we lose an engagement with the language of those other components, the language of well-executed code, the language of well-executed arts practice, the language of, you know, well-executed exhibition contexts. And it gets us to this interesting position in a company like Zynga. Um, there's a large quote here from David Marshall Nim at Nimblebit talking about, and I'll just quote the beginning, uh, we were not caught by surprise when Zynga's clone of Tiny Tower, Dream Heights, came out. What we were taken aback by was how thoroughly Zynga had copied the mechanics of our game, right down to the small trivial details that had no effect on the functionality of the game. Um, uh, but got caught up in Zynga's blanket duplication process. We end up, when we invest solely in mechanics in a kind of monoculture that we had, we had actually escaped from at the end of the 1990s. And Tad Kelly, who I disagree with wi wildly online, but actually in this case is kind of onto something, says that, you know, the main problem in these social games was that the product 
uh, was almost identical across all providers and that social game makers had trapped themselves into thinking that it had to be so. You know, that it's like, who's got the special source? Who's got the formula? Oh, it's Zynga. Let's follow what Zynga are doing. And for me, I draw parallels to the... Um, I draw parallels to the um, economic market. You have this, through the casualization of games, this huge influx of people who don't necessarily draw a say, the same kind of like perspective and value position and so on. And, and the sector more broadly becomes quite vulnerable to um, shifts, what we could imagine as regulatory shifts in the construction of games. And we end up with this notion of um, what I call toxic content where, um, in Zynga's own language, minimum viable products, products where mechanics are persuasive and sound, but everything else is, is executed at the absolute minimum level, they erode trust between developers and investors. And this really is my final concluding point. And so it's a quote from Francis Fukuyama. Trust is the expectation that arises within a community of regular, honest, and cooperative behavior based on commonly shared norms on the part of other members of that community. I'll skip to the end. One of the most important lessons that we can learn from the examination of economic life is that a nation's well-being, as well as its ability to compete, is conditioned by a single pervasive cultural characteristic, the level of trust inherent in that society. And so... To return, in conclusion, to this video game gestalt, when we talk about engagement and we talk about the contemporary problems that define the industry of social games, gamification, and so on, and we locate all of our thinking in this mechanical base, we lose, in effect, what the real essence of this gestalt is, which is the stabilizing power of it. You know, when you have an expensive art asset and it defines the real value of a video game, okay, <laughs> um, when you have that stabilizing effect of the true expense of making a video game, and we don't subscribe to this notion of a minimum viable product, that acts as a kind of regulatory influence on the mechanical component, because by necessity, they have to speak to one another. These different pillars have to speak to one another. And so we can actually only go forward when we have best practice in these areas, and we don't actually locate everything in the mechanical base. And that, for me, is the essence of Fukuyama's concept. If we're trying to maximize our profits and trying to kind of like subscribe to this kind of commercial imperative, then actually we need to see the Zynga experiment as an experiment that yielded results. And those results were a very clear statement that we need quality across the pillars that make up a video game.